uh, image analysis users. So I hope uh, you know going forward yeah, we, we can make a difference. We design we designed our portal so that way that they know something, but they still need uh, education so from the educational level up. So uh, right. hopefully, hopefully they will enjoy it. So I will do the uh, the lecture, and then in the afternoon, Truman and I together will do the uh, uh, tutorial. Right. So yeah, now it is below then um, before the talk. He will give the talk now, and then in the uh, later you will have the workshop. Exactly. I will give the talk now, forty-five minutes to an hour, whatever, and then at two o'clock our time we'll get back to um, back to you. Good. If everything is working, then I would just go get some uh, water for myself. Sure, sure. And then I'll be back in a, in a minute. I'll just stop yeah. my video for now.
So, uh, Zoltan, I'll just introduce Hilo first, and then uh, one of my students will introduce you, and then we can get started. Is that okay? Great. All right. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so, uh, it's a great pleasure today to uh, introduce Professor Mark Hilo Fige, who is currently a professor of our Applied Systems Biology at Frederick Schiller University, Vienna. He received his diploma in physics at the University of Dortmund, followed by his PhD in physics at University of Groningen, and was also a research assistant in computer physics at the University of Groningen. He was also a junior fellow in theoretical immunology at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies of Goethe University, Frankfurt. He's currently an adjunct faculty at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies of the Goethe University of Frankfurt, and he's also a member of the faculties of Vienna School for Microbial Communication and uh, International Lebanese Research School. Um, and looking at his CV, looks like he has a whole breadth of uh, interdisciplinary experience, which he will bring is bringing today with his team. And I thank um, Mark very much for that. And I believe Zoltan will give the talk. And uh, with this, I would uh, like my student to introduce Zoltan, uh, who will give the talk today. Thank you once again. I think you're muted. Yeah. Uh, now everyone can hear me. Yeah. I was just yeah. saying, Arti, one second before uh, Arti introduces. Uh, Mark, would you like to say something about the kind of work uh, you're doing very briefly and so that we get an idea of the kind of work that you guys are involved in? Thank you for the opportunity and also for the nice introduction, Ravi. It's good to meet you and all the participants here. So what we are doing in Jena is in Germany is uh, image based systems biology, where we actually combine the automatic quantification of image data with mathematical models and computer simulations. And the idea is to, in this way, gain more understanding about all kinds of biological systems that have to do with infection. So we are interested in infection biology. Today, it is Zoltan who will present the talk and we will focus on this part of image analysis and not on the modeling so much. And yeah, I'm I'm sure if I may say so that this is a very enjoyable talk because Zoltan is teaching already for such a long time and with such uh, yeah pleasure uh, dealing with students that uh, this is the reason why I'm also here. Take the time to be here. Uh, the same is true for Ruman, who will be joining in the afternoon. And uh, I can only be thankful to my team about uh, doing this uh, workshop. So this is all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, we're really excited and to have Sultan on board. And so Arti, you can go ahead and introduce. Okay, sir. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zoltan. So Dr. Dr. Zoltan started his professional career in 1985 as a research associate in Department of Solid State Physics at Debrecen University. And since then, he has worked for several prestigious organizations. And currently, he is working as a research associate imaging and image analysis specialist at the Hans Knoll Institute, Vienna. So welcome, Dr. Zoltan, and thank you so much for joining us. So before beginning the session, Tanya will tell us uh, the instructions to attend the session. Over to you, Tanya. Thank you, Aarti. I'll just quickly uh, say some instructions out for the participants of the workshop. Please do not switch your video and audio on until you are instructed to do so. Type your questions in the chat box and we will relay them to the speaker as and when the speaker is ready. You can also raise your hands and the session volunteers will get to you. Uh, that's it. Let's get started and we really hope you enjoy the session. What do you, Arti? Dr. Zoltan, you may start now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can start. Let me, before I say anything, let me just 
share my screen. Uh, screen one, screen. Let's minimize what we don't need to see. Share this one. You can share. So in principle, you should see my desktop with just a, a flowchart on it. Yes, and, we can see it. Uh, okay. I appreciate it very much if somebody gives me feedback, if everything is well viewable, so I thank you very much. And then if I start the uh, presentation, then I guess you can see it now. Is that correct? Yeah, we can see yes. you, yes. you see my title slide. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so, from my side and of Romans for uh, inviting us to, uh, to this wonderful workshop. We happen to know uh, one of the uh, participants already from um, the audience, and she gave very, very positive feedback yesterday about the, uh, what she has seen so far, a former uh, a future colleague of ours who will join us soon. So I think you are doing a wonderful job here to, uh, to organize this, uh, this workshop. Um, I'm not sure if this is the first time or, or uh, multiple times, but um, I think if it goes on as it has been so far, and yesterday I also joined, then this would be a nice tradition, I think, to uh, to do so, um, to educate people in image analysis. Um, the uh, the work group, as as, as uh, Professor Fike mentioned, consists of of image analysts and uh, imaging image based modelers. Um, I am an image analyst with some experience in modeling, but today I will only talk about the image analysis part. Um, and then I will also near the end focus and introduce a, um, a novel, um, fully graphical or visual image analysis toolkit, which we will then teach in detail in the afternoon together with Ruben, or mostly uh, relying on Ruben's experience there. Um, so, so I'm sort of as, as uh, I was introduced very kindly. I appreciate that. Uh, Roman Guest, he is uh, the person who actually wrote the software that we will teach in the afternoon. Uh, he's a PhD student who will soon graduate, a, a wonderful uh, colleague, very, very bright uh, student. Uh, and of course, Thilo, who is the, uh, the head of the uh, group. We are uh, people of 12 or 13. It varies a little bit depending on uh, how students uh, graduate. And we do, as, as I mentioned, both image analysis and modeling. This is our building. We are in Jena, Germany, uh, about two and a half hours from Berlin um, in the southwest. Um, uh, so we are not far from the, the capital either. On the other hand, we are a smaller town or smaller city. So life is a bit quieter around here. But science wise, we have the highest concentration of scientists per square kilometers or whatever um, surface unit one to, you want to use in the entire Germany. So we are very, very well um, positioned to have um, interactive, collaborative research um, on image analysis. And as um, Ravi already mentioned earlier, um, we indeed have a lot of uh, collaborations. Um, uh, Thilo's uh, CVI also showed how wide our scope is. I will have a slide at the very end, which will show a bit of a summary uh, of this um, of these activities. Uh, I will focus on, on, on host pathogen interactions today because that was anyway um, our stated goal. But uh, just to give you a quick idea what else we also do. Um, we also work with people who, who are biologists uh, in terms of carrying out their experiments because we believe that the better the experiments are executed or more precisely, better designed, the better the images that we work with. And this means that our job will be somewhat easier and the outcome, the quantitative results will be more reliable if the images that come into our department uh, are better or as good as possible. So because of this, we also work closely with, with collaborators already from the very beginning when they when they plan and do their experiments uh, on the microscope. Uh, as Tilo mentioned, <clears throat> the institute itself is focused on infection biology and the related uh, research, including microscopy and image analysis. Um, 
I'm not an immunologist, I'm, I'm a physicist, so I will not go into details, but what I wanted to uh, point out, laser pointer here, is that what I will talk about today is the role of macrophages as one of the very primary defenders of our body uh, in protecting us from various infections. And as an example, I will focus on what is anyway our main uh, area, fungal infections. That is what we will talk about today, the whole day basically, is how do we study uh, and how do we get quantitative characterization about macrophages capturing, eating, and then killing uh, pathogens, especially fungi. And we will base our, uh, both our talk and, and the tutorial on confocal microscopy images that measure or, or monitor the interaction between macrophages and fungal spores. So out of this big, 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 big universe of, of the immune system's most basic functionalities, we will focus on this small part here, where we, where we study the macrophages, either labeled or unlabeled fluorescently, and their interaction with uh, pathogens. What happens when a macrophage meets with uh, a foreign body, which should not be in our body? Um, what happens is during uh, engulfing or phagocytosis, the fungal spores in this particular case will be taken up by the immune cell into the phagosomes. And then when the, cell, then when the pathogens are in the phagosomes, the phagosome will merge with lysosomes via fusion, and this will lead to acidification, that is a drop of the pH inside the so-called phagolysosome. Now, it, now it's a merged compartment, so we call them phagolysosomes. Um, and this uh, low pH, that is high acid, highly acidic uh, environment, is detrimental to the pathogens themselves. So our goal is to characterize how good these macrophages, the various types of macrophages, uh, are able to handle the task of uh, phagocytosing the pathogens, in this case fun fungi or fungal spores, that is little uh, conidia, uh, by taking them up and then digesting them in this highly acidic environment. Uh, how, do you, how do the experiments are carried out? We deal with uh, tissue, and I will talk about this um, briefly, from simple environments where we use cell lines all the way to animal models, organs, even excite, uh, extracted human tissue, and also uh, intravital or in vivo um, human experiments with non-invasive uh, microscopy methods. We will today not have time for, for talking all about this. I just wanted to give a quick summary of, of the scale that we, that we cover in our research. Uh, what we concretely will, will talk about today is the experiment that's pointed out here, a simple um, chart from one of our manuscripts currently in work, where um, the immune cells, in this case the macrophages, are plated, for example, in a petri dish, and then once they are, are plated out and rested um, after the, uh, the, the position, fungi are added to this environment. For example, Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a main focus of our uh, institute, all the way uh, to, to yeasts and other uh, fungal species. Most of the data that you will see today and most of the data that we will use today as, as a demonstration of our methods will be from coming from the Aspergillus fumigatus um, uh, fungal strain. And then we let the macrophages chase these uh, fungal spores for a while, maybe two hours or so. Um, these um, pathogens, these, these fungi, they are usually labeled fluorescently so that we can actually see them on the, on the microscope. The macrophages themselves are either labeled also fluorescently, for example, with an antibody, or not. And, and I will talk about this in detail during the, uh, the lecture. Um, on the other hand, um, counter staining may also be necessary. I will give you details why. This is done in the next step. And once we have um, 
this environment where democrophages had time to engulf the pathogens and the pathogens have been labeled accordingly, we do the confocal microscopy experiments. What is the concrete goal of such analysis process? Well, for example, it is to monitor how well the, the uh, macrophages function, as I mentioned, but not just that. It's also the goal to figure out how we can help the macrophages do their task. For example, by adding chemicals which act against fungi, that is antifungal um, chemicals or agents, or as, as my own uh, specific field um, is here, we use nanoparticles to deliver drugs directly to the focal isosomes. You remember the, uh, the, the merged compartment that I talked to you about a couple of minutes ago. Uh, we target these, these nanoparticles um, to these focal isosomes, and when they merge, um, what you will see is, if you look where my pointer is, you will see a, a focal isosome inside that two fungal spores. These are the blue circles. And next to them, there is a little orange colored uh, dot. This is a nanoparticle, which was successfully delivered to the focal isosome inside the macrophage. In the, in the image on the right and left at the bottom, you will actually see the transmitted light uh, microscopy image. And this nanoparticle can now also, for example, because of the acidification of the focal isosome, open and release a antifungal agent, which will help to kill the, the fungi, these, in this case, these two um, little conidia, um, by releasing, for example, caspofungin, which is a, a antifungal agent which has been uh, discovered in our institute. So there is a goal behind this, not just that we want to find cells and, and, and fungi and, and have fun with that, but also we study how well the biology is doing in protecting our body against uh, pathogenic infections. Why fungi in our institute? Because fungal infections, as though, although not as frequent, obviously, as bacterial or viral infections, but they do cause a lot of problem in those people who are immunocompromised. That is, people who are already sick, or, for example, they have gone through um, chemo or, or radiation therapy for cancer, cancer treatment. One of our collaborators is from the, uh, the uh, oncology department at the clinic. Or they have already, for example, gone through COVID-19 and their immune system is weakened. And now comes a fungus which is normally harmless and attacks, for example, your lung or attacks your eyes. You, you all have heard about the, uh, the, the black fungus, uh, as they call uh, it in, in the media, uh, infection, which was an over-infection of those patients who have been treated with steroids for COVID-19. And their eyes got attacked by a fungal strain causing blindness. So it is very important to, to study this field. The other problem with fungi is that they, if they attack you and if they can grow inside you, I will saw some, saw some images about that. Uh, if they attack you and they can grow inside you because the macrophages did not kill them, you have a 50% chance or higher that you will die because we do not have the proper tools to actually kill the fungus inside the human body once it's inside and once it's protecting itself. So that's why uh, we do all this research, just to, just to give you a background that this is not pure theory or mathematics, this is actually hardcore uh, biology, and we develop the tools on the image analysis side to have the biologists and the clinicians, we also work with medical doctors a lot, to improve their tools in targeting uh, the, the, uh, the help towards the, uh, the immune cells. Okay, so let's move on to now something more concrete. Let's get a little bit of order. What you, what you see here on this slide are two images. Uh, on the left side, you see the transmitted light image. Now you know enough uh, about microscopy that you know how this is generated. This is simply a bright field uh, image. Um, it can also be done with differential interference contrast or DIC. Also, sometimes phase contrast microscopy is used, which, as you probably know, enhances the edges uh, of a cell, so it makes very thin cells visible. These guys are uh, alveolar macrophages, so these are the macrophages which protect the lung. As you, you probably know enough about biology, and you, 
see that we have astro-medical doctors in the audience. So you know much more than I do. Um, these uh, alveolar macrophages are the primary line of defense in the alveoli that is inside the uh, these little half uh, spherical shaped micro compartments of the lung to protect the fungi which we breathe in with the, with the common air from growing uh, into hyphae, you will see images of that, and then uh, basically poking through the, uh, the membrane and reaching the endothelial cells and the blood vessels, the bloodstream of the, of the lung, and thus infecting the entire body. So our examples today will come from such an experiment where we used alveolar macrophages, sometimes we call them MHS, uh, cells, and this is what you see in this image. The little round things, which are in the contrast somewhat brighter, somewhat darker, these are the actual fungi. Now, here this is Aspergillus fumigatus added directly to a petri dish, just like I showed you a few slides ago, and then we took an image of it. This is actually an image of, of three by three um, position, so it's a, it's a total of nine images. Uh, the reason for that is that we wanted to have enough number of cells in the field of view so we can get statistically uh, reliable results. What you see on the right side is the same macrophages, this time labeled with an antibody. Now, this was of course done after the biological experiment was, was carried out, that is the cells were allowed to eat the, uh, the pathogens, and then the cells were fixed and labeled with antibody. Uh, I will talk about this in a minute, how we can actually avoid this step and find the macrophages without actually having to label them with an antibody. Um, if nothing else, then it's because with antibody labeling, the cell is then fixed, that is dead. So you cannot uh, carry on with the experiments, you cannot monitor them live. But one option would be, and more traditional way, would be to antibody label the macrophages, in this case, the membranes. And of course, we also want to see the, um, the pathogens. Like I said, this is Aspergillus fumigatus. Um, the spores themselves are labeled with FITSI. Those who are working biology know what that is. That's a very, very common uh, labeling method. And in this case, um, these little donut-shaped structures, little circles, these are the actual fungi. They are a, couple of micrometers, a few micrometers in diameter, depending on the strain. Aspergillus fumigatus is, is somewhat small uh, amongst those uh, strains that we, we usually use. And what you see on the right side is a, is a second labeling, and I will explain it in a minute um, why we need a second labeling. Um, this is called Cocofro White. I just uh, abbreviated CFW from now on. Cocofluor white likes to bind the membrane of certain fungi, uh, not all of them, but many of them. Um, and then um, it provides the same labeling almost as, as, the, as the FITSI labeling, if you compare the left with the right. But what you will see is that there are fewer blue labeled uh, fungi than green ones. And I will show you in a minute why uh, that is. Um, so as at, at the end, what we will have is, is four channels in a confocal microscopy image. I merged them here together, so this is what you would see. If you turn off the transmitted light, because that basically gives you a heavy background, then merging the other three components will give you this image on the right side of the slide. So you see the outline of the macrophages and you see the uh, labeling of the fungi, both blue and uh, green. So what is our task here before we go into a uh, quantification of the, of the outcome? Our task here is to take all these images. This is from an old, earlier paper, um, just right before I joined the uh, Institute um, from um, a PhD student of ours, Antilo. Um, our task here is to identify the macrophages, in this case, antibody labeled, as well as the green and the blue labeled uh, fungi. And on the right side, you see the outcome of a uh, early uh, segmentation algorithm, which was done already before my time. And what you see is that we will have now the macrophages identified, and we will have all the fungi identified. So now we can see where these fungi actually are. Are they inside the macrophages? For example, these three here, 
for these four or five here. We also see those which are not taken up by the macrophages, these blue ones, as I'm pointing at now. Some macrophages have one or two, other macrophages have up to 10 even. So they can take up a lot of, um, lot of pathogens. And then we can count, for example, I mean, automatically, of course, we can count how many fungi or spores are within each macrophage, and then we can calculate averages or various uh, phagocytic measures, as they are called, which I will then introduce in the next slide. So now you understand what the images look like that we are dealing with today. We will focus on such type of experiment, that, but of course what I will show you today and in the afternoon is, is applicable to a much wider range of biological data. Uh, first focus on the top right uh, panel here. Um, what happens is the following as I described. We have the immune cell. The immune cell is exposed to fungi. The immune cells react and takes up some of the fungi but not the others. At the end, then we have a macrophage with, in this case, I just drew this with two uh, spores inside. One spore kind of sort of inside, but it's near the edge of the macrophage, and one spore clearly away from the, from the macrophage. So the question now is, how are we sure which uh, fungi are inside the macrophage if we don't have a three-dimensional image? Well, we have to somehow label those which, well, we have to label either those which are inside or we have to label those which are outside so we can distinguish the two groups. And this is what I mentioned, I will explain why we use CalcoFlow White in these experiments. If you add a second label after the macrophages have eaten the, the fungi that they had access to, <coughs> and, you, sorry, and you use a, um, a label which cannot get through the macrophage membrane, then what you will do is you will only label those fungi with this second dye which are not inside a macrophage, right? So for example, this fungus here, this uh, onidium, is both green and blue because the second label, which is a blue label, to be able to distinguish from the green one, um, was accessible to the, to the second label, right? So this one was green from the beginning, and now it's also blue because it was not inside the macrophage. That is, the macrophage membrane did not protect this fungus from being accessed by the second label. It's like if you are, if there's a rainstorm and you are inside the house and I'm outside the house, and five minutes later a, pe a person looks at us, I'm wet and you are not, then he will conclude, okay, you were probably outside the house and you were inside the house without having to know actually or seeing us whether we are inside or outside. Why is this important? I mean, you can say, okay, I can see that this is not touching the macrophage. Of course it's outside, yes, but how about those guys like this one, which are close to a macrophage or partially overlapping with a macrophage? Are they inside the macrophage and we just don't see the membrane extension that surrounds the, uh, the fungus? Or are they simply sitting on top of the macrophage or right next to the macrophage? That, that's why we need the secondary label. Um, do we need to label the macrophages always and do we need to label the, uh, the pathogens always except for the, for the secondary labeling? No, we can also find them label free and we will talk about this in a couple of slides. But for now, I wanted to um, introduce you to the measures, just very briefly, of what we get out from such an image analysis. So our image analysis workflow's goal is to follow this process, find out how many macrophages we have, how many green uh, spores or fungi we have, how many blue fungi we have, and how many of these fungi are in each macrophage. And then we calculate the following measures. These are the, the four mainly used phagocytic measures. These describe how well the macrophages are functioning. The, usually the higher this number, the better the macrophage is at its job of eating the fungi. The phagocytosis ratio is simply the number of 
pathogens which were phagocytosed divided by the total number of pathogens which were exposed to a macrophage. So if you pay attention to here, we are not counting those fungi which are after the experiment clearly away from a macrophage, but we will count those fungi, for example, this double labeled one, which are attached or adhered to a macrophage. And we'll talk about this in a second. The uptake ratio is a similar measure, but it is for the host cells, in this case, the macrophages. This is the number of macrophages which have phagocytos at least one uh, pathogen, divided by the total number of host cells, macrophages. The phagocytic index is a combination um, of two measures. On, one, on the one hand, the uptake ratio. On the other hand, the ratio of the phagocytose pathogens and the total number of fungi uh, host cells. The interesting thing about this uh, value is that this is not between zero and one. This is between zero and uh, uh, a number above one because this number measures on average, how many spores there are or how many pathogens there are within one macrophage on average, uh, averaged through the entire uh, experiment. So, for example, if the phagocytic index is 2.5, then you would say, okay, there are on average two and a half spores per macrophage after the experiment. So, this would be, for example, this situation. In some macrophages, you have two and some, they have three and so on. So then this ratio would be 2.5. And finally, the symmetrized phagocytic index, which is simply the multiplication of the first two measures, the phagocytosis ratio and the uptake ratio. And the beauty of this symmetrized index is that it looks at the process from both the, uh, the pathogens um, point of view and the, and the immune cells point of view. How good are the immune cells and how vulnerable are the pathogens to be uh, phagocytes. And this value, the symmetrized phagocytic index, is the one that's, that we mostly calculate at the end of our workflow. And, and you will see in the afternoon also how we carry out these calculations in JIPipe uh, using a, either a Python plugin or JIPipe's own uh, calculation methods. Um, the beauty of this index is that it's basically, not just basically, in fact, it is the probability of a pathogen being taken up by a host cell, by a, an immune cell. So if this value is 0 0.2, for example, as you will see for some uh, fungi which are resistant to, uh, to phagocytosis, if this value is 0 0.2, that means any fungus only has a 0 0.2 or 20% chance of being phagocytosed. 80% of the fungi on average will survive the attack of the immune cells, that is the person or, or the organism which is being infected is in trouble because now it is an 80% chance that these fungi will survive. That's why we usually use this measure rather than the other three. We calculate the other three and use them to calculate the fourth one, characterize the, uh, uh, the phagocytosis process. And now we go to the left and this is the actual workflow which will um, uh, lead us through the entire uh, day today. This is how we analyze these, and then we, I will show you how we develop, we, we develop tools for such uh, analysis and what kind of results can we get by using such tools and such analysis. What can we learn about the fungi and the fungal infection process itself using such uh, an analysis work? So we start with finding the macrophages. And then we look, okay, is this cell close to the edge of the dish or the field of view or not? If it is close to the edge of the field of view, this means we may only see, for example, one half of the cell or one quarter or two thirds. In this case, we will exclude these cells from further analysis. Why? Because it's possible that I look at a cell like this one and I only see half of it because it's close to the edge or at the edge of the, of the view or the field that was imaged by the microscope. So if I look at a half a cell, I say, okay, this macrophage has one spore inside, whereas in fact it has two or even three in this particular case. 
So I cannot use those cells which are at the edge because that would introduce uncertainty. So I will discard these and we're not going to deal with them anymore. If the cell is inside the, uh, the field of view, then we carry on and we try to segment it. At the same time, now we look at the pathogens, in this case, the, the green labeled, fitzy labeled fungi, and we find them. And then we, after we segmented both of them, and this we talk about the details of the segmentation, also in the afternoon. Once we segment in, segmented, then we can answer the question, do these two cells overlap? That is, does the, uh, the fungus overlap with the macrophage? If it doesn't, then we are dealing with one of these fungi, yeah? these guys which are away from any macrophage. And we are not interested in them. These, these we call the non-associated non pathogens because they are not associated to any, any host cell. And we're not, sorry, we are not going to, to measure these. We're not going to deal with these. We don't care. On the other hand, if there is an overlap, then this is a, a so-called associated pathogen. Associated pathogens means it's either fully or partially overlapping with a macrophage. For example, in this case, where my pointer is, three of these pathogens are uh, associated and one of them is non-associated. So I'm not analyzing this one, I'm analyzing these three. Now, once I identified the associated pathogens, I have another question. Are these inside or outside the host cell, the, the macrophage in this case? If they are outside, then they will also be blue. Why? Because we added a second label, carbofluoride, and this was added after the, the phagocytosis process was completed, which means the blue label did not have access to those pathogens which were already inside the host cell. This means that if a pathogen is associated, but it's also blue, not only green, then this is not phagocytosed, but it is associated to the host cell. This will be one of the outcomes that we are interested in. We call them uh, adherent pathogens because they adhere to the host cell without entering the host cell. The other group will be pathogens which are green but not blue and they overlap with the macrophage. Since they are not blue, they must be inside, protected from the blue label, and that is, these are the so-called phagocytosed pathogens. On the other hand, we have a task of identifying macrophages that were already phagocytosing, that, or to put it simply, that already have eaten at least one fungus. So the other branch of the analysis path uh, is much simpler. Do we find any engulfed pathogen inside the host cell? If yes, this is a phagocytic host. If not, then this is a non-phagocytic host. And now we have all the numbers that we need to calculate these ratios, especially, as I said, our favorite, the last one, the symmetrized phagocytic index. And before I go into the technical details of how the analysis segmentation itself is done, I wanted to show you just a few slides about why this is useful. And I used our own work uh, just because then, then I can use any graphs that I want to illustrate the results. For example, um, we had a study with a collaborator. Um, we have a large um, fungus collection in, in our institute, the second largest in Germany. We did a, um, a thorough study across various species of, of fungi. Aspergillus fumigatus was the, was the reference, and otherwise we used the so-called Lichtheimia series. <coughs> and we studied how the various Lichtheimia species behave in terms of phagocytosis. That is, what is their symmetri symmetrized phagocytic index? That is, how vulnerable are they to be taken up by a macrophage across various species of the Lichtheimia uh, group. How, why did we do this study? Because we were curious whether, um, for example, the origin of the fungus plays a role in how resistant or um, sensitive or vulnerable they are to being phagocytos. So what we did was, 
we did the analysis. We, we measured hundreds of petri dishes, our collaborators did. And from those, we ex extracted the symmetrized phagocytic index, which I just explained to you. And then we measured this, the average value and the distribution of the uh, measured values for all kinds of uh, Lichtheimia strains and the Aspergillus fumigatus labeled AF. This was always the reference. And we had dozens and dozens of these graphs, believe me. And then at the end, what we did was we measured are these results, are these groups of Lichtheimia species linked somehow to each other? Do they behave similarly in certain groups? And what we found was that indeed, when I examined, for example, the correlation between the symmetrized phagocytic index and the phagocytic index, <coughs> what we found was that um, all the uh, all the strains that we examined, and there was like 19 or 20 of them all together, they grouped into clusters. And this is what I labeled in these dashed lines areas. And if you lose, if you look at any of the uh, these four colorations, you will see that there are three groups of, of dots, uh, what, which I label with orange, one with green, one with deep uh, uh, purple. And then we asked, okay, they form clusters, so for example, the orange behave similarly to each other, the green and, and red. And we did check this uh, using a method called DB scan to actually check the statistical significance of this clustering behavior, and we found them uh, statistically significant. Well, um, what, bounds, what binds them together, as we found out when we looked at the data, is their geographical origin. Those with the uh, highest uh, phagocytic index, they came from Asia. We had data from Pakistan, China, and Japan, and they clustered very, very closely to each other at the high symmetrized phagocytic index range. Those with the lowest vulnerability came from Africa, especially from Egypt, and those strains which came from North, Northern America and Western Europe came in between. That is, we discovered by this workflow of analysis that um, the vulnerability of, uh, of fungi depends or may depend on their geographical origin. Another study that we did was um, based on the following. And, and as I promised at the beginning of the talk, we will talk um, some details about how to find these um, host cells and pathogens without labeling them uh, with an antibody or FITSI. But for now, let me just show you one of the results that we got by using this method. We discovered, for example, that labeling the macrophages um, with a live cell label, in this case DID, or labeling the fungi themselves with uh, FITSI, that is the, the grain label that we dealt with so far, will change the symmetrized phagocytic index that we measure. Because okay. it's... Sorry? You okay. If you have more than one infecting agent, then you have to somehow be able to identify them separately, either based on their shape or with fluorescence labeling. So we do work, for example, with co-infection of uh, fungi and viruses, or bacteria and viruses, especially the latter. But another question? Yeah. A very good question, and we will have the details discussed both in the lecture and especially in the afternoon. What we do is we measure, we segment every uh, pathogen and every host cell individually, and then we will run it through an algorithm which measures the overlap between the two basic circles. The, the large circle or large roundish shape would be the macrophage, the small circle will be the fungus, and then we measure how much the overlap is. And then you have to set up a threshold. This, this is a bit arbitrary, of course, um, how much overlap you consider overlap. Yeah? Um, in, the, in the workflow that we will show, uh, we used 50%, so 0 0.5 as a, as a threshold of whether it is overlapping or not. We will show you in the afternoon how this is done also in 
Jai Pai. Um, any more questions, Truman? Thank you for reading those very much. Um, yes, so what we discovered was that if we label um, the macrophages with this DID to make the membrane, in this case, red, then the measured symmetrized phagocytic index goes down, and the higher the concentration of the dye, the more it goes down. With the FITSI labeling, it was the opposite. The FITSI labeled uh, uh, spores were taken up by macrophages more readily, that is at a higher probability than the unlabeled ones. And then we will talk about in a second how we find these um, fungi uh, and macrophages without actually labeling. And for that, I would like to show you what the, um, these experiments look like when um, we carry them out uh, in, a, in a petri dish. So what you see here is a one hour long um, recording at a confocal microscope, but in this case, we are just using uh, transmitted light uh, microscopy of macrophages sitting by themselves. Whereas on the right side, you see the same uh, preparation, but now we have Aspergillus fumigatus added to the, uh, to the dish. And what you will see here is that, for example, this large cell here takes up a whole large group of fungi. This one here in the smaller one um, takes up, starts taking them here, and then it ends up with about a dozen or so uh, fungus inside itself. So we are actually able to characterize the process itself already by using uh, transmitted light microscopy. Now, if we combine this one with fluorescence labeling of the, uh, of the fungi, uh, in the, on the left side, you see the transmitted light um, movie, and on the right side, you will see the green dots of the, uh, of the fungi, the Aspergillus fumigatus, we can follow basically each and every one of them as they are being taken up by the macrophages. This one, as you see, takes up a whole lot of um, spores in this particular macrophage, whereas some others are more passive. So this way, you already get a feeling of how much percentage of the macrophages are actually active in terms of taking up um, spores or, or Pathogens. Um, what kind of a conclusion can we get from this besides calculating the symmetrized phagocytic index? Well, one possibility is that we measure how active the macrophages are when they are chasing fungal spores, that is pathogens, compared to how agile they are when there are no pathogens around. So the two, the two movies that you saw on the, uh, on the previous slide, one with uh, just macrophages and no spores, and one with macrophages and spores were analyzed. And the macrophages were tracked in time, traced and tracked in time, and their speed was calculated. And what we found was that the macrophages, which were alone, if I plot the, the, um, the histogram of their speed distribution had a, an average speed of approximately, I would say, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 micrometer per minute. This is where the peak um, of this um, distribution is. On the other hand, if I um, look at dishes, petri dishes, where the macrophages had fungi together with them, then the same speed distribution histogram will have much, much higher values than it did with macrophages without the spores. What this means is that macrophages are more active when there are pathogens nearby. That is, they are chasing, basically, after the spores or the fungal spores, the, the pathogens. Now, this is in a petri dish, yeah? so we can analyze this. Um, again, the technical details will come in a few minutes. We can analyze these, but um, this is not so physiological. Yeah? These, these are cells in a petri dish. So uh, not a way around this one is to use a more realistic um, approach, and this is using organs-on-chip models. Organs-on-chip are 
basically, just like you see the, uh, the, the scratch here, they consist of an epithelial and an endothelial layer of cells, which are separated with a plastic membrane. And this membrane uh, works as a scaffolding. It, it keeps the whole uh, organ together. And these cells, the epithelial and endothelial cells, can be plated on this membrane and grown under physiological conditions, you know, 37 degrees, um, proper CO2 and oxygen, and, and moisture, uh, humidity uh, concentration. And then um, the, uh, the pathogens can be added to this uh, model, and immune cells, the macrophages, for example, can be added to this model. And then basically you have a model organ on which you can do similar experiments to what we just saw in a petri dish. And then what we get is uh, an outcome um, where we are able to measure this tissue in, in a confocal microscope, have a three-dimensional image stack, and then reconstruct in this uh, movie that you see the growth of a fungus. If the fungus is not killed by the macrophage, it will grow and it will produce more and more and more fungal cells. This will lead to the formation of a so-called um, hypha. And this particular cell, if I go back to the laser pointer, this particular cell here is labeled in blue. This grew several hyphae, as you see, and this grew into a, a network, a complex network of um, and this means that if you let a fungus grow and the macrophages do not kill them, for example, if your symmetrized phagocytic index is very low, then a large number of, of fungi will uh, live. They will survive the attack of the macrophages. And then what happens is what you see here in this model uh, organ, they will grow into a tree of, of hyphae. And this hyphae actually can also enter the blood vessels. And once they enter into the blood vessels, they can break off from the, uh, from the structure. And then if you look um, on this side, now the um, fungus can grow from this side. For example, in, in, the, in the lung, you, grow, you breathe in a fungus and they grow. And these hyphae then grow through this tissue into the blood vessel. And once the, uh, the fungal cells are in the blood vessel, they can spread everywhere in the, bloody, in the body with, um, with the uh, uh, circulation system. And now you are in big, big trouble. So if your system cannot deal with um, fungi, then um, your uh, chance of dying is very, very high. Now we have a more physiological model, so we can also monitor what these um, macrophages do in such a uh, model organ that is an algorithm on a chip, the lung on a chip. And what you will see here is a, a live uh, 4D confocal microscope image that is time and three dimensions, where we see the macrophages moving around. And in green, we will see the labeled fungi. And then we can monitor how these macrophages chase and eat the fungi in a model organ that is under much more physiological condition. And the analysis results you will see on the right side, the, the colored structures, these are the individual macrophages. The coloring, is, the coloring is just random so that you can see them separately. Whereas the, the green dots and the, uh, these thin lines, these are the fungi that we tracked also during the analysis. These uh, analyses, as you see so far, have been done um, using labeled cells. So both the macrophages and the spores were marked with a fluorescent label, a label which then um, survive, uh, let, lets the, uh, the cells survive so you don't have to fix the tissue. This way we were able to monitor and analyze in, in 4D, uh, in this particular case using Gimaris, how these cells behaved, how their uh, speed changes, uh, how many uh, fungi were taken up per macrophage and so on and so forth. By the way, if you look at um, the last frame of this movie, you will see these fiber structures. These are 
fung fungal uh, hyphae, that is the, the growth that we saw before on the uh, um, segmented video in the previous slide, at the end of this experiment. The experiment was 13 and a half hours. So as you can see, in basically half a day, if your lung is not protected properly by the macrophages, the lung is overgrown by fungal hyphae. That is, it's taken over by the fungal infection. The functionality is then gone. You cannot breathe. And then it uh, very, very fast. Fungal infection can cause very, very quick death in, in the infected patients. Now, this is very uh, nice so far. We have um, our goal. We know what we want to uh, conclude from these experiments. The question is, how do we do this with our own tools, without having to uh, use proprietary tools, for example? And as many of you now are familiar um, with, uh, with the toolkits, ImageJ is one of the most popular uh, choice of weapons in this particular case. And our toolkit, JIPIPE, which will be uh, presented in the afternoon, is also mostly based on ImageJ. Um, the first task is to discuss briefly of what we do if we don't want to mark or label the, the, uh, the cells that we want to segment with fluorescence labeling. And then you saw that fluorescence labeling itself may actually change the outcome of the biological experiment. Well, what we do most often is, or used to do with, with the classical image analysis, is to use the so-called Hessian filtering to reveal the outside, the outline of cells which are not labeled. The Hessian filter is quite simple, actually. It's the second spatial derivative of the image itself. And, and you learned about this yesterday, how and, and day before, how an image is basically a, a matrix filled with, with numbers, either floating point or integers, depending on your uh, conversion. The point is that this is a two-dimensional matrix, which you can then simply calculate the derivative of uh, in space according to x and y. And this way you have a filter, which consists of these second derivatives. Why is this good? This is very good because a second derivative is very high if your structure that you're looking at is curved. So first of all, the second, the first derivative is the largest if there is a gradient of intensities or, or uh, uh, other values in the image. The second derivative is largest if this um, gradient is actually curved. Yeah. So a Hessian filter will give you the highest intensity if you're looking at a circle. Now, macrophages are circular, and fungal spores are even more circular. So our derivative calculation using the Hessian filtering in image J will simply give us a nice contrast where you can see both the macrophages, the large objects, and the fungal spores, the small, bright, uh, donut-shaped object here. So now we have a contrast without having had to label the macrophages based on which we can identify where the macrophages are. And then if you look at those images that you saw before, um, but those uh, time we were also labeling them, here you will see the macrophages by themselves or the macrophages together with fungal spores, the contrast having been generated with Hessian filtering. So now we have something to work with where we can apply intensity-based analysis algorithms to identify the objects. And if you zoom in, then you will see the details even more. Um, as you see, the fungi are actually brighter in this second derivative image. Why is that? It is because the second derivative is sensitive to the curvature. That is, the smaller the radius of the circle, the higher the second derivative absolute value. That is, the higher the Hessian filtered image. So now I have an image from which I can find both the uh, macrophages and the fungi, even from the same image, if I use two different thresholding values, because the macrophages are darker than the fungi. And that's indeed what we did here. So as you see, we have the transmitted light image from which we applied the, uh, the from which we calculated the Hessian filtered image. And then after uh, thresholding and morphological uh, combinations of steps, 
which we will discuss in detail in the afternoon, step by step. We identified the macrophages, and as you see here, this is very, very successful. This is a very simple analysis procedure, but it's very successful in finding uh, macrophages individually. In this particular uh, case, we also used green labeling for, for the uh, fungi, but we were then able to find both the macrophages, the green fungi in F, the blue ones, and then the merged image. And now we have, as you now understand, we have everything that we need to calculate these uh, phagocytic measures. So this is basically a complete workflow of how we analyze two-dimensional uh, labeled or unlabeled, um, as we call it, um, to the interaction between host cells and pathogens. This was published in, in an earlier work, and then we will use this experience to go further. Now, let's talk about something else for a second. Um, Dr. Solti? Yes, of course. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just wanted to remind that we are reaching the end time for the session. It's okay. I, I have I have a few more, but uh, we also started a bit later, so um, because of the introductions. But thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about one one uh, practical problem. So far, I've shown you how we deal with individual images, just one image. Um, a big bigger problem is that if you have a whole set of experiments, which we usually do, then you not only have a few images, but you have a whole lot of them. So we can use indeed ImageJ to do this analysis. And, and as I said, JIPipe is also built up on ImageJ. But when you have a large number of images, then you have a repetitive uh, analysis process which requires that you somehow um, program the workflow. Now, many of you are not necessarily keen on, on learning programming. And the ImageJ macro programming itself is fairly straightforward. Um, you may want to also avoid that. Um, as an example, uh, we will show this in the afternoon. You can record every step that you do in ImageJ. So you may actually already know this from previous lectures. And these recorded steps in the macro can then be turned into a real macro, so to speak, and use this as an automated tool to use uh, to analyze a single image. If you want to use it on multiple images, then you have to, first of all, get the list of the images that you want to analyze. And then you put the code that you wrote for the previous single image analysis inside this loop. And this will carry out the analysis for you on a whole number of images. And now you can do hundreds of thousands of images without having to you know, sit there and watch the program work. Now, if you don't want to do the coding itself, then you would have desired to have some kind of visual programming tool where you can have you know, boxes which can be connected to each other. And then the actual code that runs the processing is running behind these boxes. And that's exactly what we did with the uh, leadership of our great colleague, Ruman, who was uh, already assisting us today with the questions. He will present most of the, uh, the technical parts in the afternoon. And this is JIPipe. This is a Java-based image processing pipeline built upon uh, functionalities from ImageJ as well as ImageJ-based macros and uh, plugins. Um, if you studied image analysis before, you will know that there are uh, similar tools or, or somewhat similar tools in terms of being um, graphical, fully graphical, and these are NIME and IC. Those who are interested can look into this one. We have compared our uh, framework with these two, um, which we will not go into the details of. But the main point is that um, this way we can have a framework building tool, JIPipe, which is again built on ImageJ, but does not require you to actually write the code. So the code that you see here is replaced by a set of, uh, the, as we call them, nodes, which carry out the processing. And this is what you will learn in the afternoon, how to build such a workflow how to connect, how to choose the proper uh, steps, the proper nodes, how to connect them, 
and how to carry out the batch processing using uh, fully graphical analysis. And we used it for, for many, many different tasks. Um, what you will learn in the afternoon is how to use it for the analysis that I just showed you in the first um, part of the lecture where we um, uh, analyze macrophages and fungal spores. Um, these are just some details about JIPipe. We might mention some of this in the afternoon, but it compares very well with the existing tools. And uh, Roman in the afternoon will explain how these nodes are built up. So this is just a summary slide, how you can control the functionality of each node, the inputs and the outputs and the connectivity. Um, and this is uh, to, to conclude the application of, of uh, this workflow to our uh, so-called confrontation assay analysis. This is the outline of the actual concrete workflow that um, we built to analyze the images that we just looked at in the previous uh, part of the lecture. That is uh, the image reader and then the analysis of the antibody labeling of the macrophages, the green labeling of the fungal spores, the blue labeling on the, of the fungal spores, as well as the transmitted light uh, imaging based, that is Hessian based analysis of the macrophages. And then, the analyze ROI um, compartment does the calculation that we talked about. Uh, and the, as one of the questions was about that, how much overlap do we have between uh, the macrophage region of interest versus the, the fungal region of interest? And the last compartment will then calculate the phagocytic measures, the, uh, the four phagocytic measures that we uh, talked about. And then um, in the afternoon, you will also see how these individual compartments are built up. So we will not go into that right now. You would not um, gain too much from this knowledge anyway. But I just want to show you then the, uh, the outcome of the, uh, of the analysis workflow. This is the outcome of the, uh, of the Hessian base that is transmitted light based segmentation of the macrophages. On the right side, you see the antibody labeled uh, outcome of the macrophage uh, segmentation. This is for comparison comparisons purposes. If you look closely, you will actually see that um, the Hessian base actually does a better job than the antibody labeled one. So not labeling can also even be advantageous. And these are the outcomes of the blue and green spore segmentations. And as a summary, uh, just to zoom in to show you the, um, the actual outcome. So this means that now we have um, a toolkit which can carry out um, a guided analysis, a classical image analysis of any number of images without having to worry about programming and also without having to worry about how to analyze more than one image, how to do batch processing that is. Um, there is a second line of that where we also com combine this uh, analysis uh, pathway or workflow with deep learning based analysis, but that's not really the subject of this presentation either. So I will skip that. Um, and then what I would like to do, if there are questions about it, of course, then I can um, show that. But in the meantime, what I just wanted to do Go to last slide here. This is just a summary of what we do apply our analysis techniques in our work group here in Jena. As you see, JIPIP here is one of the, uh, the main focus points. Uh, Roman and I work on this almost exclusively. But we also have a lot of uh, subjects and techniques and tissue types, cell types, organ types that we uh, work with. So I hope that you learned what the basic concept of, of host pathogen analysis is. And with that, I would like to, of course, thank the group. Um, this is a fairly new group photo, actually, just a couple of weeks old. Ruman, who will mostly guide you through the afternoon session, although I also will be there. Um, and our collaborators who come from most various places, uh, places and the, uh, the funding which actually pays my salary, uh, the nanoparticle research. 
Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, then of course, I'm yeah. happy to yeah. answer. Okay. Is it possible to this from the bottom associated with the other things uh, for that, you would probably need labeling because um, the second derivative, uh, which is, like I said, basically measuring the curvature, will not be different enough. Uh, another approach is to, um, if you have a large enough number of, of images and data, um, to use a deep learning method to identify, to separate, to classify them, and we also um, are working on that. Um, in our efforts, but otherwise you would need some sort of um, counter labeling, basically. So it's all pathogen labeling. So it's all pathogen. Yes, of course. As, as I, I probably, I hopefully mentioned it at the beginning of the lecture. I will foc I have focused. Uh, on this particular application, but the principles are very, very similar in many applications. And, and the summary slide also serves that purpose to show you that um, this is not limited to host pathogen interactions, but the subject of this session is that, and but from this you can also generalize um, the techniques to, uh, to others. We, we, we use, uh, for example, the tool to analyze the um, the movements of of nematodes, worms, uh, C. elegans, for example, which have nothing to do with uh, with macrophages, but the same principle and and analysis techniques, even Hessian filtering, works quite well for that too. Or we analyze live organs, kidney, liver, lymph nodes, for example. We apply different microscopic modalities like. Uh, Multispectral optoacoustic tomography, MSOT with a with a colleague of ours, Bianca. So it, it's really generalizable, quite quite nicely. And if you guys also have concrete questions of of examples, we can also discuss those happily in the afternoon when we have a, a interactive session. Yes, and that's what we usually do actually. So the um, the experiments that you saw um, had antibody labeling of the macrophage as a control, but the actual image data that served the basis, for example, of those two studies which I showed you, um, were done exactly that way, that the macrophages were not labeled, but the, um, the fungi were either genetically green or fluorescent or labeled with FITSI, and then it was in the same experiment that we did uh, unlabeled and labeled, yes. It's a very good question. Is that all? Okay, anyone else has questions, you can speak also up. Okay, then I guess that is it. I thank you for your attention and then um, any further questions, please collect them and then bring them up in the afternoon session um, where we have three hours anyway, so we have more time to, uh, to go into technical details of, of the various steps that we had to ignore uh, this presentation. So if there are no more questions, we would like to wind up the session. Thank you, Dr. Zoltan, for the wonderful mm -hmm. talk and showing us the welcome. power of image analysis to study host pathogen interactions in both 2D and 3D model system. And I thank you again for answering the queries of the participant. And uh, this is for participant. Uh, we will now meet again at 5.30 uh, p.m. IST for tutorial session. And I will request all the participants to be ready with the JIPI plugin installation on ImageJet and also download and extract the data set for the tutorial session. So the material has already been shared with you yesterday. So thank you everyone. And I look forward to Roman's talk at 5.30 p.m. IST. Thank you everyone. See you guys later then. Bye. Bye, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Bye now, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ravia. We'll see you in the afternoon, yeah? See you, bye. Good, okay, bye-bye.